Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Big Red Book Payroll Modernization Webinar Briefing. Um, thanks for taking the time from your busy schedules to join us today. Uh, we've got a busy schedule to go through and we will uh, get to it all. Hopefully you'll be uh, more informed about this topic when we finish the, uh, the briefing session today. Okay, so let me start by uh, going through the agenda of what we're going to cover today. So we're going to look at the background and main points to this topic, uh, PO and modernization. We're going to look at some of the key challenges that were faced by revenue employers and employees at the beginning of this. We look at some smart design principles that revenue have uh, included as part of the overall modernization project. We look at how this very closely integrates to payroll. We look at some new concepts that are coming to payroll, uh, that of RPN, Revenue Payroll Notification, um, it, which is really a process of getting the latest tax credits from revenue on a real-time basis before pay making payroll payments. Uh, employment IDs and how, how an additional employment ID is needed for each employee in addition to the PPS number. And we'll look at some of the reasons for that. Um, this is a, one of the big surprises people have seen, the absolute forms abolition and their replacements. So all P forms are gone, P45s, P60s, P35s, and so on. And we'll also look at the uh, two sides of the relationship in terms of ROS and the My Account Portal, that of employees and that for employers. And there, there's a, there's a chain, there's, there's changes coming there and they're being, um, they're being improved. We'll also look at employer readiness, what we think you as um, employers need to do in readiness for this upcoming modernization. Um, and also we'll look at some practical takeaways and advice um, for you, your, your staff and your empl employers. And we'll also look at what Bigger Book Peril is doing in readiness for this. Um, to begin with, I want to make one really key important point Point, and that is to keep calm and get ready for modernization. Um, yes, it's a big change, it's coming, but we have your back here. Uh, we will help you get through this as payroll providers. Uh, in fact, if, and there's a big project ongoing in the entire industry to make sure employers in general are ready for this change coming down the tracks. Okay, so to begin with, I'm going to look at the background to modernization, uh, when it was announced, why, why it was announced. Um, and it starts in October 2016 with a very um, quiet announcement of Mike Noonan in his budget speech that um, POA modernization would be introduced. At that point, you know, we had very little idea what was going to be coming down the tracks. Um, so it's interesting to read this um, section from Revenue's consultation paper, paper that demonstrated, that gave their statement as to why they wanted to uh, implement this new system. And I've highlighted some key points here. Um, so basically they're saying that the economy is moving, uh, people are moving jobs regularly, uh, there's separation, divorce, and different kinds of families happening, and different tax arrangements arising therefrom. Um, there's a lot of people with doing agency work, multiple concurrent employ employments. We've got the gig economy uh, with you know different people having multiple uh, jobs. And that makes the management of taxes um, complicated in those arrangements. Um, so they saw an opportunity for real-time reporting to solve some of those challenges. Uh, particularly, as I said in the last paragraph there, given the complexities of today's employment patterns and structures. So to begin with, I'm going to give an overview summary of the main points that will then uh, do a deep dive into a number of these points as we go through the presentation. Um, so the first one is really a move from an end of year return to revenue. We're all familiar with the end of year return to uh, revenue, the P35, to a real-time electronic submission of detailed payroll data as employees are paid. And that's really important that as employees are paid, you must submit the detailed payroll data. And we, we'll, 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 we'll look at more detail of that as, as we go through. Um, and this communication will be based on a secure interactive communication with revenue servers, avoiding file import and export. Um, so this really is real time. It's like a, 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 a connection from your payroll software directly to revenue servers. And it literally happens instantly. There's some more slides on that later on in terms of how that happens a bit more detail. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the existing returns, so specifically P30s, P35s, P60s, P45s, and P46s will all be abolished as part of this process. Um, we will look at what replaces these, but the general thinking is because revenue now have information as it happens, there's no need for uh, historical looking reports to see what happens. You know, so for example, P30 is a statement of liability based on what you've paid employees over a month or a quarter. Uh, now revenue will know immediately once you've paid somebody, they will know exactly what tax USC, uh, PRSI and so on have been deducted from that employee. And there's also big focus on taxpayer compliance. That's one of the things I want to um, bring to you today as employers. Make, make sure you're compliant and, and don't fall foul of the revenues, increased compliance uh, testing across the entire uh, employer ecosystem. 
Um, as, as part of that, revenue are using data analytics to streamline monitoring of taxpayer behavior. Uh, so that's an interesting topic as well. So make sure you don't, uh, you know, that you're, and, and once you remain compliant, there's nothing to be fearful of here. Once you remain compliant, uh, you won't raise any red flags for, for, for revenue. Um, another big change that detailed payroll submission data would be available to um, employers in ROS as well uh, visibly of payroll data by employees. So as soon as you submit a payroll uh, and submit it to revenue and it's, and it's uh, approved, um, you, the employer can log in and see what data they've submitted and they will see a quick screenshot of, of some work in progress on that later on. And also, and more importantly probably, is employees will be able to see it. So now there is very big visibility for employees to go in as soon as they receive their pay for their employer. They can now also go into the My Account portal in ROS and verify that what the employer has put through for them is all is, is what they've been paid in their pay slip and that they've returned that to ROS as well. So no more of this employer not sending the P30s or the information to revenue or, or you know, withholding tax from employees and not making revenue aware of what they've been done. That's that's a really big change. And they're also encouraging, and this actually in fact has happened already this year uh, and last year, and that is the self-management of credits and bans by employees in the My Account portal. So employees, uh, particularly going back to those employees that might have multiple employments, can themselves log into the My Account portal and split the, um, and split the credits and so on between the different, um, between the different employments, employments that they have across different employers. And the goal live date is the 1st of January 2019. Uh, and that was announced back in 2016. Um, and at that time, we weren't sure if the work could be done. But uh, I can tell you at this point, um, it's, that's definitely a, an absolute goal live date. There's no pulling back from it. Uh, work is well advanced. We're well advanced with revenue, as are the entire industry. The Payroll Software Developers Association are involved with revenue as part of this. Uh, and we're all on board in terms of this, um, in terms of this deadline. So it is happening in January 2019. Um, sorry guys, before we go to the next slide, one thing I did want to say at the start is there is live chat, some of you may have found it already. We have our team here um, in the office answering uh, questions during my presentation. I won't be reading uh, the chat, uh, the questions during the presentation, but at the end of my presentation, um, I get the team to collate a couple of questions from you that they maybe haven't answered or they want me to answer. So if you have questions, certainly pop them into the chat window and either the team will answer it now or if there's any remaining at the end, I'll take maybe a few questions at the end as well. So yeah, apologies for not covering Okay, um, somebody from my team has a mic on, so if, if all our um, uh, Big Red Book staff can just make sure your, your mics are muted, please. Thanks. Um, so firstly, uh, sorry, the next thing I want to do is dispel some myths that have been out there, and some of these have been out in some, uh, some even national publications, so I think it's important to dispel them. The first thing is that it is about real-time reporting, not real-time payment. Um, in other words, you're sending the data about the, about the about what you've deducted, uh, but you're making the payment on the same schedule. Uh, so if you're currently on a monthly or quarterly payment date with P30s, that will remain. But obviously, there'll be much better visibility of the true liabilities. Uh, you know, there's this anecdotal evidence out there that you know employers might put in a, P, a P30 and maybe reduce it slightly because there's cash or pressure in the summer. But in the winter, you know, it might be better, and they can. Uh, and basically, a lot of sins get covered up in the P35 because once everything's balanced by the end of the year. Um, all is good and revenue will never know that that happened. Whereas now they'll have real-time visibility of what's happening from a liability point of view on the employer as they pay their employees. And then it was that the calculation of liabilities remains the responsibility of the employer using payroll software. Um, and that is different than any of you who have UK payroll will, would be aware of RTI, real-time information in the UK. Um, and it, it is a myth that our system has been copied from the UK and that is not in fact the case. Um, the payroll software would still calculate the USC, the PUA, uh, the PRSI, the levies, and all of that. Um, so that, that's kind of an important one to, um, to, 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 get, to get straight. So just going back to the key challenges revenue saw back in late 2016, early 2017, um, they came up with um, the following executive summary. So they saw that this was a fundamental change in both philosophy and practical application. Uh, for you know, for revenue and employers, it is a big change because we've been used to the old regime of doing the return at the end of the year. That, that that's a real mindset change. Uh, for all employers, they saw that it required a change in salary payment practices. In other words, when you submit your payroll, you're making a statutory declaration. Um, historically, you might have been paying your, your employees, you know, making deductions. Uh, while they were statutory deductions, you didn't make the statutory declaration until you did your P35 or P30. Uh, whereas now you're doing it as you're paying the employees. You need to make sure that your salary practices are good, that you minimize the errors. Errors will, of course, happen, but you need to make sure you have processes in place to 
deal with them, catch them hopefully before it's minute revenue and fix them as soon as possible. Um, so they need to focus on the quality and actually that at payday, not afterwards, not, not at the end of the month, if you're paying weekly and not at the, certainly not at the end of the year. They don't want uh, you know, a massive number of end of year adjustments because you haven't been making the correct payments during the year. Um, and they saw also, this is the point I made earlier, there is real time visibility of payroll data to their employees. So you need to make sure as an employer that you're making it right so that the, so, so that, so that the employees aren't going to question what's showing up on their portal. They had a particular concern around smaller employers. Um, so they did say at the time that they were considering the needs of smaller employers. Um, there's some concessions in terms of you can use a portal update um, information as opposed to using software. We obviously recommend you use software, um, but and they haven't really kind of really answered the, the broadband internet uh, connectivity question other than saying you must be compliant. So I think um, you need to make sure that you have access to um, to, to a web connection uh, to be able to use peer organization is, is really what they're saying. Um, so as part of this, Revenue came up with what they call SMART, which is an acronym for a number of things. Um, they call it the SMART design principles from a number of the interested parties' point of view. And the first party was from the employer. Uh, so these were the design principles in designing modernization and how it would work and how this new system would work. These are the principles they came up with. So they wanted to see seamless integration into payroll. While it is not mandatory that you use payroll software, they prefer the fact that payroll software is, is much more real-time and much more interactive way of driving this requirement for employers. So they do recommend uh, employers uh, use payroll software. And they did want to minimize the employer cost to comply. Um, might be some question about whether that's happening in reality or not. There's obviously a big push as part of this in, in implementing, but you do see in, longer, in the longer term that it will uh, be minimized costs to employers. Yes, for the abolition of those forms you mentioned, P30s, P45s, P46s, P60s and so on, um, at, at the end of the year return, because as I said earlier, they will have the data in real time, so they won't need to, uh, to have those returned. And, and by the way, I should clarify, when I say abolishing those forms, we're not just talking about the paper-based version of those forms. These forms are all available electronically to be filed online, so it is literally the electronic form version of these forms in addition to the pure paper version of these forms where paper, version ex where paper versions exist also. And also the right tax paid and current due dates. I said that part of the um, focus of revenue here is in compliance and they want to make sure that the right tax is paid. Uh, at the right due dates. Uh, because they'll have the data, as I mentioned earlier on, you know, people can't mess around with your P30s. You will have to pay the tax as you have deducted it uh, from your employees in, in real time. Uh, and also time saving. They see this as time saving because once you've done your return uh, to revenue when you've paid your employees, that is it. There is no, you know, end of year reconciliation, P35. Your return is done. Your statutory declaration and return is done as soon as you push that button. And we see later on that when you are using payroll software, that return and declaration happens, you know, literally instantly uh, across the connection to the revenue server. So they do see that long term, it will give a time saving to employers. Um, I think they do acknowledge that there'll be some initial um, time to learn a new system, to get used to, you know, the little quirks that will be, will potentially be there in, in the new year. Uh, but do you see a long term time saving happening from this new system? So, from the employee point of view, they also came up with a SMART acronym. And from an employee point of view, the S standard stands for Simplified Online Services. So, as an employee, uh, you can actually log in and see your tax uh, credits and splits. You can actually see that today. But in addition, you can also see what pay is there for each of your employees. You can see each individual pay slip with the, um, sorry, pay declaration uh, with the tax POA, USC and so on. One point to make up, to emphasize here is that it won't have the detail of, you know, salary, overtime and so on. It'll be the taxable element. So it'll be the gross taxable pay, the, the USC deducted, the PRSI deducted and so on. Um, so the aim is to maximize use of entitlements. Um, and that means, I guess, two things. One is making sure you, you actually split your credits and your bands across your different employments to make sure you, know, you don't have any unused credits. And also to do have a campaign to make sure people are aware of the um, allowances and credits they're, they're, they're entitled to. For example, they do advertise on an annual basis around the entitlement to medical expense relief. Um, so they do say you know, they're happy for people to have credits and to get relief where they're actually entitled to them. And they want to help with that via the portal. 
Um, while there isn't an end of year, you know, formal process for the employers, um, there is an, an end of year review to make sure that employees haven't been over or under taxed. Um, what they do anticipate, though, is that during the year, if there's any kind of strange situations, they will be detecting that with their analytics. So, you know, let's say an employer is incorrectly running the system, and under the new system, it'll be quite hard because you get your credits on a weekly basis electronically. But let's say somebody hasn't done that and they've given an employee incorrectly credits not entitled to, revenue will be hoping to catch that during the year. But failing that, they will do an end of year review to make sure that you know the tax the employee has paid across all our employments will ultimately be correct. Um, and also real time accurate data, so the employer, the employee will be able to see uh, accurate data absolutely in real time. And transparency, and that's about the employee seeing what the employer is doing on their behalf. No more fudging of what whether the employer has returned their full pay or not. They can log into ROS independently of any login that the employer has given them, or any pace that the employer employer has given them and verify independently that um, their data has been correctly submitted and their payroll that they've got into their bank correctly reflects what the employer is showing. From Revenue's own point of view, they also came up with the SMART acronym. Um, and the one they really like is the statutory in-year employer return. So pushing that button is basically your statutory reporting done as soon as you pay employees. So on the 7th of January, when you pay your weekly employees, you, when you've done your submission of payroll, your return is done. And, and, and then they have that data to further analyze. Uh, bear in mind that historically, they would have waited until the middle of February or March the following year before getting the employee level detail. And um, yes, you will have received P30s during the year, but bear in mind the P30s only have total level PY and PRSI and USC. It doesn't have any um, employee level details. I see it as making compliance easier. <clears throat> that means that they can enforce compliance in a much easier way as well. So um, they see that as, an, as a tool in their arsenal to make sure that they can um, detect any kind of uh, tax evasion and any incorrect stuff that's going on with, um, with taxes. Um, they also see it as, um, in time, making sure that data is accurate and up-to-date uh, for employees. This affects things like employees, you know, going for claims, even stuff like employees going for mortgages, they will be able to go to their My Account portal and get a statement of what their taxes have been across the various employments that they have. Uh, but for all kinds of reasons, um, the government generally needs to see what pay has an, an employee has. And sometimes during the year, they would have asked for pay slips. Um, and that can be incomplete. An employee might have multiple employments. Uh, whereas this way they will have a central uh, view, holistic view of an employee's, all of their income and all of the tax deducted across all of their employments. Uh, so that gives them a really good set of data. Um, they expect reduced customer contacts. This is one uh, in the Payroll Software Developers Association we kind of questioned uh, because we think initially there'll be increased customer contacts as people get used to this regime. Uh, but you do expect that in time it'll settle down and because the data will be flowing in real time that, um, that, that employees will eventually have, um, uh, and employers will eventually have reduced contact with revenue. And this one, which is an interesting one, and this is from their slides, by the way, of the source on the bottom, uh, revenue um, update slides from one of the stakeholder means timely targeted interventions, which means, you know, using the analytics, the real time data, they will see where non-compliance is happening across employers and will be taking action uh, in a much more quick manner than they would have historically. Historically, they would have needed to wait for the uh, arrival of the P35 and then analyze it to find out that there was a problem or some employees weren't handled correctly during the year. So it's going to really um, make their job a lot easier in terms of being able to get to problems uh, very, very quickly. So as employers, we need to be aware of that. You know, it's something to be afraid of, uh, but once you remain compliant is the, um, is the most important thing. So one of the points we made from an employer is the seamless integration to the payroll process. And this is a slide actually from, again, one of the revenue um, stakeholder meetings in terms of how this actually works. And we, we dive into this in a bit more detail and so cover some of these concepts. So the overall flow is the employer will get the employee details into their payroll software. Um, the get latest payroll information is like the current P2C, getting the credits for the employee. Um, and that would be a, a, an API call, a call to their servers in real time. We'll have a bit more information that coming up. Um, you run the calculation, we'll in payroll, finalize it. And then there's kind of three main outputs, a bank file to the, to, to the bank to, to pay the employees, the pay slips to the employee, so they get their, their pay slip, and then the revenue report, which is a payroll submission to revenue. So it all happens in real time. And they are uh, anxious that the payment 
of the employee coincides with the return of the information to revenue. That's really important from their point of view. So once you make your payment to your employees on or before that, you must do your submission to revenue to say what you've paid them, what you've deducted and so on. Um, they're also emphasizing the fact that they do like the file, it, it, that the fact that it's a bank file as opposed to cash. Now cash is still um, okay to pay, but they like the, the bank file because again, from a compliance point of view, there's an audit trail and they can see exactly what's happening. As you're just digging down into that a little bit further, um, this is what the new payroll workflow looks like for you as an employer using, for example, Big Red Book payroll software. So it starts by getting the latest RPNs, uh, again, which is getting the, getting the credits. Uh, you'll then enter your timesheets, process the payroll as normal. So 0.23 uh, and four, in fact, are all the same as what they are at the moment. So all you're really making sure at the very start of the process of interacting with revenue is that you've got the latest credits and bans from, from revenue. Once you've done the file to the bank, then you submit the file to revenue. That's, that's, that's kind of the new piece. Um, and, and following on from that, you need to check the payroll submission because sending the file to revenue is one thing, but making sure that it's correct. So they will, they will do that check of the file. <clears throat> and that check can actually happen uh, very, very quickly. Um, and what I'm saying here is if you're using auto-update in Bigger Book Payroll, which is you know, where you have your salary recurring amount set up, the whole process can take minutes. That payroll submission to revenue and the subsequent check actually happen in real time. So we're talking about potentially less than 10 seconds for the whole process to work. Um, so I said it earlier not to panic in terms of, you know, does not, while yes, there's a workflow here, it's not that it's going to take, you know, a long, long time to get payroll processed on an ongoing basis. So let's dive into the RPN and just see what that actually is, what it means. So it stands for Revenue Payroll Notification. Um, so it's a term to get used to. It'll be bandied about like, a bit like the old, way the old P35s are. So it's essentially requested electronically by payroll software before commencing a payroll run. So before doing your payroll, you want to check with revenue. Has anything changed? Have any of my employees got new credits? Have I any new employees where credits have arrived? And so on. The data is, in fact, similar to P2C. It contains up-to-date tax credits, call-offs, USC information, and cumulative totals per employee in the event of P45, where they're coming from a, a, a new employment, a previous employment. Um, when you get it back, there's a unique um, RPN reference included, and both be included in some in subsequent submission of the payroll. Now I'm putting in the words there, it may be rejected. Initially revenue had said it would be. Um, at the moment it's saying that they will check it. Um, so that's something that might change before the final um, uh, the final delivery of, of, of this happens. But it is important that you do check it. Uh, because if you don't and somebody's credits have changed, it means you're paying them incorrectly. And that's, that's really what it is. Um, and it can also be used by employers to request um, RPNs for new employees, so where somebody's coming from a previous employment. The other concept that they've introduced is what they call an employment ID. This again is an important one uh, to get to understand. Um, and it's really a unique identifier per employment for each employee. It's in addition to the PPS number. Um, and the purpose of it is to deal with um, cases where an employee might be working for an employer in two branches. You know, you've got you know, a Cork and a Limerick branch of a cafe. It's a single registered employer, but they have two different branches. They're running the payroll in two different payrolls, but it's the same registered number. In that case, um, they will need to have two separate employment IDs across the two employments. So it'll be the, um, so the, so the unique identification of revenue becomes the following um, combination of three factors. The employer's registered number, plus the employee PPS number, plus the employment ID. Um, and in the My Account portal, the employee will be able to split credits cutoffs uh, for each employment ID. And this solves the current big issue for temporary casual staff across multiple um, employers with branches where previously revenue were issuing temporary PPS numbers. Uh, so if any of you are in that situation, it's important that you uh, deal with the employment ID um, and make sure you have unique employment IDs across your different branches. Um, and if there's any kind of concerns around that, you can certainly talk to our support staff um, because that's an important one to get right. And that's something that can actually be done today. This is something that we have in the current version of the payroll software. <coughs> The tip is not to change the employment ID once the submission has been made to revenue or else if you do create a new employment ID, revenue will see it as new employment and it will have zero credits unless the employee goes in themselves and changes it. So that's something to be, uh, to be mindful of. Now just some technical considerations um, just to understand. 
So the first one is how to handle errors. Um, and we've seen earlier on that revenue really suggests and recommends that you have a good payroll process in place to minimize the instance of errors, but inevitably er errors will occur. Um, so they would really prefer an adjustment in the following period. If you overpaid an employee, uh, you know, underpaid them the following time and, and adjusted because they want the what you pay the employee to match what payroll submission was. So they do prefer an adjustment in the following period. But they have um, facilitated and are kind of give you a concession of giving the option to delete or replace a, play, a payment. So delete would be, for example, you made a submission that wasn't real, you know, employer employee had left and you left them on the payroll by mistake. And actually I should, did, so that would be delete example. Uh, and the replace example will be where somebody's been, you know, it's it's a mistake basically. It's a, you've paid them 200 euros instead of 150 or 250. Um, but they don't, they will not accept an entire batch being rolled back. So rolling back needs to be on individual employees, not an entire payroll batch. So that's an important point. And the reason they give for this is what they call the downstream effect of a submission. So, you know, somebody might be getting social welfare assistance. They might be on something else. If you've done a payroll submission, um, it is in real time. Within seconds, revenue have that. And it's then obviously available across the, you know, the, the, the revenue system. So if they've made a decision or a determination on the employee based on the bad data, um, and then you do a correction, they've got to manually go in and see, well, has this, uh, what, what is the effect of, of this, this downstream effect, as they call it? So they prefer to have uh, an incremental uh, adjustment as opposed to going back and, um, and, and deleting the previous one. Security is a big question that comes up. I'm sure you all have questions around that. Um, so the submissions will be secured with a specific digital certificate for the purpose. So um, you get your normal raw digital certificate and you, you, you link it in with your payroll software and that, that will be used. Um, the payroll software will access that digital certificate when making submissions. There's no need to log into the ROS website. As with all digital certificates, every time you use it, you will be required to give your password. So, so it's not just good enough to have the digital certificate. You must also have the matching password for that certificate, irrespective of any password you may have set from payroll. So it is secure from that point of view. And also from a security point of view, all traffic between the payroll software and ROS is over a secure encrypted connection using SSL, if you know what that means. It basically means uh, that the traffic in between time is, is encrypted and only both ends of the connection can actually read the data. So there is no issue with the security of the data moving from one side of the connection to another. Um, and I know there's a question that has come up, but it is possible in ROS to get subserts. So you can go and get a subsert that, can, that can, will only be used for POA, for employer POA. So if you're concerned about the use of that cert, you know, by a payroll operator who maybe you don't want them to have access to the corporation tax or the income tax or the other taxes of the business, you can actually have a scope limited digital certificate. So you can have one that just lets them do the, 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 the required POA submissions and then use that cert in, instead of your, 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 your main uh, digital cert. Um, I know starts is one of the questions we've had some on support already, so um, we, but we'll certainly answer any of your questions on that if they um, if they have arisen. Okay, so I've said we're um, there's forms being about so each one of these forms P60, P45, P30, P35, P46 are all being abolished. Okay, so the question is what replaces them? So let's go and have a look. So the P45 and P46 that's really about employees joining and leaving companies. So the replacement is replaced by a payroll submission by the employer with the commencement and then cessation dates. So you, you do a submission and you have either a start or end date. That flags revenue that either somebody has left or somebody has joined. Um, there is an or, and this is one that they do kind of like and, are, and even this year have been encouraging, which is that the employee themselves would manage their employment record in the jobs and pension in the My Account. So in there they can say, I've got a new job, give me my credits, because then it encourages the employee to you know, split the credits across the new employment and the existing employment if they're still you know, casually employed across more than one employer. B30 um, is gone because the total tax is based on the total of all the submissions during, during, during the year. Um, the employer payment can be made in line with that, with current payment dates. Um, and these again points revenue have made, so debt management for underpayments in the year, non-filer interventions, and in year interventions based on risk analysis. Those three points are really saying that they're going to having a deep look to make sure that what people are declaring as a liability is what they're paying when it comes to their payment date or if they're on direct debit, that direct debit matches very closely the amount. So it might put direct debit uh, filers under, under, under pressure depending on, um, on what their liability pattern is across the year. 
And the P35, now there is a final payroll run. What I've said, there's no final end of year P35 form. There is just a flag to say, I've run my last payroll. Because if you're running weekly payrolls, you might pay one or two weeks up to the end of the year. So it's really just a flag in a payroll saying, I'm done, here's my last payroll. And really, that's all it's, you're saying revenue is that you will submit no more payrolls in respect of that year. Um, so the total tax at that point will be calculated based on the final report plus the previous month or quarter. But really at that point in time, revenue will have a really good idea as to what uh, as to what the, uh, the liability is. Um, uh, and again, the debt management and the non-filer interventions there based on the final report. The P60, um, so basically that's a report really for the employee's purpose. So during the year, the employee can view up to their pay and deductions in POI services. Um, and they can get a final, once their final re um, report is processed for the employee. So that flag I mentioned under the P35 replacement, um, there'll be a flag on the My Account saying, this is, this is the sum of all of the payrolls for this employer for the year. And that'll just be flagged on the, um, on the report that they'll have from, uh, from the My Account portal. So this is just a view, this is from our kind of testing area. Um, I've just taken kind of just a quick screenshot just to see what it looks like. This is what from an employer view. So up here, we're looking at viewing a payroll, uh, putting which payroll we're viewing. I'm reviewing it for, for January. And here is a sample of what comes back. So this is an example where we've put through a test submission uh, and come in, and once it's submitted, and literally this happens within seconds. So submitting bigger of a payroll and log into ROS and here's what you see kind of pretty much immediately. You see what's been submitted and over here you can drill down on the, on the submission see the individual pay slip details with the individual tax, POA, PRSI, USC, even um, the, um, the, the property tax and so on. So you get full visibility here directly in the portal. Um, this is what it looks like from the employee point of view. So, um, and this is here today, in fact, this, this, is, this is from the live site. Uh, so the employee can log in with their PPS number, date of birth and password. Um, and within POA services, they do have an option here to add a job or pension. Um, so it is based on employee uh, self-service. Uh, and so they can currently add jobs, manage tax credits and cutoffs. Uh, but from 2019, they will have real-time visibility of employer submissions and the ability to view total pay and taxes across all of their employment. So it's, it'll be really useful for employees to see that starting from next year also. Uh, Revenue did do uh, a lot of data analytics, as I mentioned earlier, and a quality review. Um, and it's just important to be aware of, of actions that they have been taking and are taking at the moment um, arising from that. Um, so they have a new requirement. I'm sure most of you may be aware of, the, of it at this stage. We have had queries into our support desk on this. Um, so they're requiring a, a, an employee list to be uploaded by employers. And that's because they saw a lot of non-compliance across the base. You know, P45 is not submitted, P, um, P46 is not submitted, and, and, and others like that. Um, it'll be used to reconcile uh, revenues employee records with the employer records. What you're basically doing is you're saying, here's everybody I have employed with me today. Revenue will compare it with what they have, and if there's any differences on it, um, uh, they will basically automatically P45 people on that. There's a submission deadline of the 30th of October. I think that might be the 31st, actually. Um, uh, and they will automatically P45 any employee who is not on the list. So that's one to be make sure you have done by the, uh, by the end of this month. Um, as I said, our payroll software supports this. You produce an XML file and upload it in your OS, in, in your OS um, directory, your OS portal. And the returns that they have surprised revenue, they have, they have had some poor quality of data, particularly across uh, SMEs. So it's just one thing to be, make sure that you have uh, done this and that you then review the results of it. And, and there is an option in Bigger Book Payroll to, to produce the required file. Um, and they do have also a deregistration campaign underway because they had a lot of uh, companies who had no returns uh, for greater than two, zero, two years. So if they, have, um, if they have detected those companies, they have been written to at this stage and they're deregistering them unless you make a specific request to, uh, to remain active. So looking at revenue and their approach to modernization, here's kind of what they've been doing and, and kind of some of the messaging they've been giving out. So they have been doing a lot of employer visits. Um, I know from feedback we're getting from our customers, they're doing, they're, they seem to be focusing particularly on very small employers um, and actually charities that there have been a number of charities we're aware of that have been visited as well. So in terms of they may not have full-time payroll departments and they want to make sure that people are ready for the upcoming modernization and, and ready for it. 
Um, yeah, and so, as I said, they're focusing on smaller micro enterprises. Um, they are doing parallel testing. We're involved in that process with them with some nominated employers, and that's been underway since uh, the middle of last month. So uh, parallel testing and reprocessing some of the payrolls for the early years and processing the current the current uh, couple of months payroll as well to make sure that this is working. We're getting the same results um, and so on. Uh, they have had a very active engagement with a number of, of main stakeholder groups, that being the employers. Uh, I know they've had a number of seminars across the country. Uh, I think they're still, still ongoing at the moment. And I mentioned payroll software suppliers, or we're involved via the PSDA with that, the Payroll Software Developer Association, and also with the professional bodies. Uh, and they're also using a lot of data analytics to review what's happening with both employers and employees to kind of understand what's happening and use that to guide how they interact uh, in this new area of in this new era of real time information and PY reporting. Some practical takeaways and advice. Uh, the first one is if you are running multiple payrolls for single registration, it's really important to get familiar with the new employment ID concept and uh, uh, allocate a code per payroll. That's how we're, we're doing it. We're allocating a code per payroll and that will then be a prefix to any employment IDs you do for employees and that. If you don't have multiple um, payrolls, you don't need to do that. Um, but, you, but you do at least, as a minimum, need to allocate a single employment ID. And one bit of advice here is, you know, don't make it complicated. You know, we've seen all kinds of people trying to turn it into different things, but in bigger book, our default is just to give them a number. So give everybody one. And then if they come back again for second employment, it becomes two and so on. So just keep it simple. Uh, but it is up to the employer to decide what they want to use for that um, employer, uh, employment ID. Make sure you clean up employee records. You're probably doing that anyway as part of the um, target to get your employee list sub sub submission submitted by the end of, um, by the end of October. Yeah, that's the point there. Um, <clears throat> also, it's time to stop net growth arrangements with employees. Revenue strongly recommends not uh, green net growth arrangements. They haven't yet said and haven't said that they're banning it outright. But they do feel that it really goes against the grain in terms of you, you should agree a gross amount with an employee and then apply the credits that they give um, uh, to you to do that. Given the fact that employees will not be able to self-manage credits very easily, um, net to gross kind of doesn't make sense because no matter what a tax credit or band or you'll see band changes, you'll still be giving the employee the same net and varying the tax. Uh, so that kind of doesn't really make sense. So we kind of really recommend uh, moving away from such net to gross arrangements. And get payroll 2019 installed as soon as it's available. Um, we haven't announced the release date yet. Uh, budget was only last week, but we are working on it. Um, and 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 but get 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 your payroll installed as soon as you have it, and get familiar with your new options. Um, in terms of our readiness, what we've been doing, just have a look at some of that. Um, so we have been engaged in this process via the PSDA, the Payroll Software, uh, Payroll Software Developers Association, uh, since October 2016. I think two days after that budget, we were in with revenue uh, as part of that group discussing the implementation. That, and that's been an ongoing process in the meantime. Um, there has been very regular updates, stakeholder meetings that we've attended as part of that, technical specifications and guidance and revenue on, on, on implementation questions. I would say it's, it's, it's almost there, but there are still some minor clarifications happening. Uh, but we're well down the tracks in terms of having software ready. And so we are running uh, tests in the parallel area. So it is, uh, it is getting there. Um, revenue have opened also their PIT platform, which is a test area for us to um, test the software, make sure that it's running as expected. So that's separate to the parallel test. And that's where, um, with, where it's a full-time replica of the real system, but it's only with some sample data. And as I said, parallel testing is underway with, with, with real customer data. Um, working on all, we're currently working on all the required changes at the moment and um, budget in 2019 was announced some minor changes, USC rate, tax bans, employer periods increase, uh, but no fundamental or structural changes. Um, so, but we still need to implement the new calendar for the tax year and so on. 
Um, also, just to say that we are running some deep dive seminars um, starting countrywide in November. Um, they'll be about an hour, I think there are two hour sessions uh, right around the country. I'll have a list on the next slide. And we do encourage you to sign up for those also. Um, we will be showing uh, some of the, we can't, because Parallel is customer down, we can't show it uh, in those seminars, but we will be using the pit with test companies and de demoing the system with test information to show it, um, to show it in action. Um, so that's something to uh, that, that's something to put in your diaries. Um, I said the next slide will have a list of those. Um, and here is that list. Um, so I'll leave it up there for a minute. Um, uh, so it's across the country. So hopefully there's one within kind of some reasonable distance of you. Um, there's a link at the bottom there. Um, so it's biggerbook.com forward slash POA dash modernization. Um, so if you're going to go to that link, um, you'll, you'll, you'll see the, the, the sign up page after that. So I, I will personally be delivering those sessions around the country. Um, okay. And that's my presentation. Um, so thanks for listening. We'll, we'll have a Q&A in a minute. Um, so let me just go offline for one minute and let me just check what the team has in terms of questions. Um, so hopefully you've all been uh, getting questions asked and hopefully getting some answered. Um, okay, um, I'm getting a question here from my colleague to do a live demo on creating a list. Uh, so let me um, see if I can get that set up. Okay, if, if, if you wanna continue a, a, answering questions, I will just, just need to get that set up. Just give me two minutes and I will show you how to produce the list. I just need to get access to a payroll company. Uh, so if you wanna hold on for a minute, um, use the chat for asking any additional questions that the team will do. And I think the team might um, filter some of those for me to answer as well. But let me jump now to showing a demo of the employee list creation. Uh, just go offline for a second. Okay, guys, hopefully you can hear me again. Um, maybe one of my team uh, could actually catch me if you can just confirm you can hear me and you can see the payroll screen. Um, great, so we're ready to go. So this is currently your payroll with a test company. Um, I'm actually going to demo a few things. I'm not going to just show the list. I'm going to show uh, just the setting for, because employment ID is part of this as well. It's not required that you submit employment ID, uh, but it's, it's recommended that you do it um, if, um, if you're submitting the employee list. You, you must do it if you have dual employees with the X and T PPS number. So if you have that situation where you have split employees across employments, you should really do the employment ID. Okay, so let's start by going to settings. Um, and this basically is where you can have an employment ID prefix. So this is optional. So if you do have multiple um, companies, uh, you can actually optionally put a, I uh, put Dublin there, I might take it out. So I might just leave it blank for, for purpose of the demo. Uh, if you had, so if you had Dublin and say Cork as two different branches, you'd do DUB here and CORK as the second one. And then it would prefix that in the employment ID to make sure it doesn't cross, uh, across, it doesn't duplicate across those employments. So, um, so before doing the submission, I do highly recommend in that case and that you use this utilities and employment IDs to generate employment IDs for all your employers, employees. Um, this is sample data, guys, so we don't have PPS numbers for everyone, so, uh, but we'll go ahead with the other two. And I, so we'll just go and generate IDs. So what it does is it updates, I'll just say no to this for a second. So it shows you the, the suggested employment ID. You must have a PPS number in order to have an employment ID and you must have a PPS number in order to update your employee list also. So in this case, we'll only have these two employees. But I said, this is just test data, so uh, hence that. So click on update employees, hit okay, and we'll close. If I go into my employee records, I will see that the employment ID is set here for employee one, employee two, it's not set for the other employees. So this isn't in the current version of payroll. You, you'll, you'll have seen this. So that's what its purpose is. We do have a tool tip here also. You can click and it just gives you an explanation as to what that is. Okay. So having done that, um, then I'm going to show you the update of the uh, report to, um, to revenue or the creation of the file. So go to reports and create RAS list of employees. And we do have a message here in terms of explaining what it is. So it's kind of covers some of the points that I've, that I've made. Um, Clicking OK. So essentially what you do is, OK, we have some missing data here, so they're shown in red. So you must have an employer registered number. One in there. Um, and phone number. They do require a phone number. And the address. OK. And then we create the XML file. That will create the file in location. 
um, you save it in your ROS folder, and then you go onto ROS and submit the so, and submit the file. So that covers the um, so that covers the creation of the file. One actually important point, I'm not sure if I made in the um, in, in the in the presentation, is you can only do this once in a single session. So if you have maybe multiple lists, maybe for multiple payrolls, you can submit multiple files, but only in the one logged in session. So be really sure if you are doing it that you have up that you have exported all your XML files from across all your uh, payroll systems before you do the the upload. Okay, so I'm just going to go back to my team here and just see what other questions uh, I've been asking. Okay, so question here is uh, just to re re reiterate the process on submitting to ROS. Uh, there's a lot of questions about that. So essentially, uh, let me go back to the, um, let me stop sharing this and share the, um, the process again. Give me one sec, guys. We'll go back to the presentation. Let's share my screen again, and let me just start the presentation at that slide. Okay. Okay, so it's this point here to submit payroll to revenue. Uh, essentially, while, once you've done your, your payroll processing, you will have a screen, a grid, with, let's say you have 10 employees, you'll have 10 employees showing that they haven't yet been submitted to revenue. Uh, you will literally push a button, it will look for your ROS password. Once you hit that button, it will send all of those payslips to revenue and immediately wait for a response from revenue. I said earlier on, I think that will take seconds. So within a couple of seconds, revenue will come back and give you a success or a fail on the, uh, on the file. And you can even come back later on and confirm it. So each payslip then is marked as firstly submitted to revenue, and secondly, um, confirmed by revenue, revenue have accepted it and that there's no errors. Uh, the errors will just be if you have incorrect data. Not, not that the payroll calculations are incorrect, but that the data is valid, that all the fields are correct, that there's no you know, incorrect values put into fields. Um, so um, what I would say is we will have some to show on that at the seminars. Uh, we, we're working on getting a working model together with the software that we have. Um, so if you are interested in seeing that in, in, in a full demo, we will demo that uh, during the seminars. We'll have a, we'll have a live uh, kind of play of that. Uh, but you will have a new option called Submit to Revenue within the payroll buttons. Um, okay, let's see if there's any other questions. Okay, another question here, which is, um, okay, some people think they have to have a bank file. Um, I did say revenue like that, but it's not a requirement. So you don't have to have a bank file. Um, so if you're using PayPal at the moment, you can use that. But if you're currently paying by check, that's still um, all very well and good as well. There's one kind of definition from the POA and revenue really kind of hot on the regulations and the legislation, which is it's the day you pay the employee. So if we give you a check or cash, it's the day you give them the, the payment. If it's an electronic file, it's the day the money arrives in the employee's banks. Uh, so that kind of hopefully answers that question, but you don't absolutely have to have a bank. Um, another question here, um, who requests the RPN? The RPN is always requested by the employer. Um, it's the employer's responsibility to request the RPN. The employee can go into their portal and allocate their credits, uh, but it, it, they won't see the RPN request. The RPN is done by an employer looking for RPNs on behalf of all of their employers. Um, somebody else asked about, um, they've done the list of employees without the... Um, the employment ID, do you need to resubmit? No, you don't need to resubmit. Um, it's done and dusted, but what you will do in the new year is your first submission, uh, allocate the employment IDs, and on your first submission during the year, include the employment ID and then pick it up from that. That's what the process is there. Um, and the other thing is to just to bear in mind, guys, I mentioned it, but to, to emphasize the payroll process, this bit here, enter timesheets and processing payroll, remains exactly the same. Uh, it's just that the credits and colors you'll get won't be coming from you entering them on screen. They'll be coming from an RPN that you, so for RPN, read P2C. That's really what an RPN is. You know, if you have overtime, time and a half, whether it's taxed or not, all that stuff remains 
absolutely the same. It's not that dramatic a change in terms of how you process the payroll itself. Um, somebody asked about, um, and it's a good question, um, Kay, uh, in the west of Ireland, um, and the broadband connection can be poor at times. Um, if the broadband is poor, it, it, the, the connection to revenue is very light in terms of what it transfers, unless you've got you know tens of thousands of employees. So even if the bad broadband is slow, that would sort of work. Um, there is a failsafe where, I did mention that revenue liked the idea of the API in the real time, but it is possible to download the files. For example, an RPN file can also be downloaded and imported into payroll. Um, that's something that we, we don't have in there at the moment, but we are planning to do to uh, cover some of these scenarios. Um, but even if the broadband is poor, once it's present, it will, it, it will get through there. They'll make it pretty resilient. But of course, some places will have zero broadband. So uh, the solution to that is to go so somewhere that has broadband and do files. I will say that it's not just a matter of getting the RPNs, but you, you need to get the RPN, then do the submission, that's another file, and then get the confirmation back from revenue, that's a third file. So if you do plan on going with files, it is, you know, there is, there is a little bit involved over back with files. So if at all possible, I would do this with a broadband connection. Um, let's just check my questions. Um, Marcella is asking about um, <coughs> allocating the employee ID. Um, let me just go back to my payroll. I'll just show that again. Um, can I confirm you can see that payroll screen? Hopefully you can, so get used to this sharing. Um, so, perfect, thanks Catherine. So go to utilities and employment IDs, and you can simply generate it from in here. So literally all we're doing is we're generating ones. You can manually do it on the employee record also if you wanna just do that. Uh, we're just doing a sequential numbering sequence, starting with one, um, but I can also go to an employee record here. And if I want to, I can just go to each employee individually and, and, and key it in. So that's possible as well. Did that answer your question? Okay, so somebody's asking about are tax payments required to be paid to revenue the same day as employees are paid wages? Um, and that's one, of, going back to one of my slides, that's one of the myths that's out there. In fact, it's been published in the newspapers that that's the case, and it's not the case. Um, the, this is about returning your liability, not about paying it. So the payment regime remains the same. If you're on a monthly p you still pay monthly. If you're paying your employee weeklies, you'll, you'll have done four submissions and revenue will know exactly what your p is. There's no need to give them p um, If you're on ROS direct debit, uh, presume they will just take that um, or you can pay it over ROS debit instruction. So, but no, the payment is a different thing. That is not to say that that won't change over time, but today what the plan is, is that they will uh, keep the existing regime in place. So that answers your question. Okay, just waiting to see if there's any other. Okay, so Olivia Gardner is asking, currently doing manual transfers in online banking for wages. Uh, is it easy to set up a pay file in bigger book? Um, okay, um, so it's included in our software, Olivia, so there's no additional charge to us is the first thing. Um, the bank you do need to get onto, so the bank, um, there is a charge for doing the file, I think. I'm not sure what the charges are with the bank. Um, it is relatively easy to set up. Um, the PayPal settings is here. Um, so from your bank, you will get a, uh, this, basically this information you'll receive from your bank. Um, you set it up and then you, when you run the payroll, you have the option of creating a, a PayPal file also. Um, it isn't set up here, so I can't really show it here, but um, there is an option within reports to create um, a PayPal file, either a standard 18 file, which Bank of Ireland is still accepting, the old style, or the separate file, depending on your setting. So that can be configured. Um, somebody's asking about the Q4 P35 uh, duty submit in January. No, the, the, so the submission of the returns, Liam, is, is as employees are paid. Um, there is an end of year thing just flagged to say you've done the last return, but there is no, um, there's no submission happen in January for anything that happened uh, in, in December. There is no P35, P35s are gone uh, because the, um, oh, sorry, you're asking about 2018. Yes, sorry, of course. Um, yes, Liam, I think for 2018, uh, it will be the same, uh, deadline as, as before, yes. Um, 
uh, Kevin is asking a, a question that has come up before, um, which is what if you're away uh, or in hospital not available? Uh, those questions have come up. Um, that's not something we can answer. We ha I have suggested that people go to the revenue seminars because revenue are kind of really kind of sticking firm to the, to the letter of the law to say, look, you must make some arrangement. Um, now, the holiday thing, they do say on or before um, you can do the submission. So you could potentially do the submission before. Um, however, bear in mind that if you're going away for three months, you know, RPNs may issue between the time you do the submission of, of payroll and the, um, and the time the, pay, the payment is actually made. Um, if you're paying um, holidays in advance for employees, um, in that case, you must actually submit the return anyway because it's when the employees are paid that you must um, submit it. Um, I know that may be not fully answered your questions, uh, Kevin, but I think that's something to take up with revenue. If, if any of you have still have tickets to go to any of the revenue we webinars, that was one question I strongly encourage people, including accountants, to go and ask. Um, Nolene is asking about uh, processing weekly and monthly payroll. Are they both in one payroll? Yes, they are. They can be. Um, it's, it's up to you. And if you have uh, our payroll when you run the submission, it'll show both weekly and monthlies together. Um, uh, what I did on the submission, uh, let me go back to my screenshot here. On the example I did. Um, and we'll, put, we'll go into this in more detail on the detailed seminars. But if I just share this slide here. Um, so when I was reviewing my payroll in, Re in Raj, you need to give it a payroll run reference. So for example, the payroll run reference is January 2019. Now you might have January 2019 as a monthly reference, and then you might have Jan 2019 W1, W2, W3, and so on. Uh, to split them logically, it's up to you. Revenue will take a lot of references here, but that's maybe one thing I would maybe recommend if you have mixed payrolls, that you use the payroll run reference. Um, and also each submission has a reference as well. So for example, another way to do it might be everything in January is January 19 as a run reference, and then you do the weeklies and the monthlies with their own references. Um, Paul Lacey is asking about a fortnightly payroll you have staff in two different weeks in the same company. Do you need employee IDs? You, you, you need employee IDs anyway, Paul. It's a requirement no matter what, um, no matter what you're doing from payroll. Every employee needs an employment ID. It's mandatory from next year. Uh, sorry, maybe I should make that, make, make that obvious in the slide. Maybe some of the team might uh, um, make a note of that, that we should really emphasize that it should be, um, it should be mandatory. Um, Jean is asking about making, um, doing the first two weeks of 2019, will I be able to do them in advance? Yes, you will. The rule is you on or before, so it, December is before, you know, say the first week that you're paying them um, of 2019, so you'll be able to do it in advance. I, 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 they do plan on issuing the RPNs in early December is, the, is my understanding at the moment on that. I'm not 100% sure, but that, that's what I understand. So you will be able to do that, uh, but you will have to have RPNs. Uh, in place, and, and obviously we, we will have our payroll software shipped at that point as well. Um, okay, we're running up to three o'clock, um, so I'll take maybe one last question, um, and um, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Then, thanks for your attendance, guys, and thanks for the questions. It's great to get the uh, get the feedback and questions. Um, so um, <clears throat> let me take one last one. I've answered that one. Helen asks, what well, is only one person doing payroll and goes on holidays for a week and two RPNs requested in a week? Um, well, an RPN is requested for a person. You, you, um, if, if something hasn't changed, you, when you check for RPNs, it will be the same one as before, if that makes sense. Um, so, um, but you can, in, in that case, in the payroll in advance, you can just do, run the payroll um, and do two submissions if there's two payrolls to be done. Um, guys, I'm conscious, I'm just checking with the team here, there's actually a lot of questions here that we're not going to get to uh, answer. Uh, we're actually going to try and get back to all people on the questions uh, by email. I will try and email all of you, I think you've all registered with an email, so we will try and get back to the ones I haven't picked out here for answering. Uh, so a, a brilliant engagement for you guys, so th thank you very much for that. Um, and don't forget, we have the seminars coming up. Um, in November, the link is was on the slide, but just go to our website, you'll, you'll get it there, or e email or call any of the team. Um, and we will send a copy of the slides at some point as well. 
Um, we'll uh, just make any corrections that, that any feedback has given us on, from the slides. We'll, we'll get those out to you all as well. Um, so I'd like to finish off by thanking everybody for your attendance at the webinar. Uh, it's been great to get the feedback. Um, uh, again, emphasize it's a change is coming, but we're here. We're going to be sure that it's, it's, it'll work for you. Um, so don't be stressed by it. Um, it it'll work. Um, and everybody's in the same boat. Um, and um, that's it. Um, so I'd just like to finish off by thanking you all and have a good day. And thank you for your time. Really appreciate your time in joining the webinar today. Thank you very much.